about uh, Bainite. And this morning I'll talk about the theory for Bainite, and this afternoon how to use that theory to design new kinds of steels. So this is a, a time temperature transformation diagram. And I've got a time temperature transformation diagram for iron without any alloying elements other than carbon. And here we've added some manganese. And you can see that that retards all the transformations. But the important point here is that when the reactions are slow, we can separate the time temperature transformation diagram into two regions. Okay. This is a C curve at lower temperatures corresponding to transformations which cannot happen by diffusion. So they are displacive transformations. You have to deform the parent crystal into the product crystal. And the reconstructive transformations, where the atoms diffuse. I think that's my uh, computer has gone to sleep. <laughs> I'll just set it so that it doesn't do that. So we can divide the time temperature transformation into two regimes, one for displacive transformations, one for reconstructive transformations. And in a reconstructive transformation, you basically take your crystal, break all the bonds, and rearrange the atom in a way which minimizes strain energy. And that requires mass flow, okay? so diffusion. These transformations do not happen at low temperatures because there simply isn't enough diffusion. When the reaction rates get fast, there will be an overlap because our <coughs> experiments cannot detect the separation between the two curves. The experiments simply can't cope with fast reaction rates. So we see a single curve, but in fact it consists of two regimes which we can separate by calculation. So the published time temperature transformations do, uh, diagrams don't always show these two separate C curves. They often just show a single curve, which is a consequence of overlap between two C curves. So in principle, the diagram consists of two separate regimes. And it is in this regime that we get the Bainite transformation. Uh, the driving force isn't sufficient to support martensitic transformation, and I'll explain why it isn't sufficient. But nevertheless, there isn't enough atomic mobility to support a reconstructive transformation. So this is what the mic different microstructures correspond to. Martensite we've already covered. Here we have the diffusional transformations, the grain boundary ferrite that we often see, or the perlite. Uh, here we have the different kinds of bainite. I'll go into those in detail. And there is also a transformation called Wiedmannstein ferrite, which I'll cover towards the end of this lecture. And of course, they have their transformation start temperatures, just like we have the martensite start temperature. So, the difference between the so-called upper and lower bainite, and this is a, a microstructural classification which is extremely well established, is that when you form bainite at a relatively high temperature, the plates of ferrite are completely free of carbides, and instead you get cementite precipitation in between the plates of ferrite. As you lower the transformation temperature, you also precipitate cementite or carbides inside the plates, as well as between the plates. Okay. So this is such a well-established transformation uh, uh, characterization that basically uh, any theory has to be able to explain why we get these detailed microstructures as a function of temperature. The scale of the microstructure is actually uh, much finer than that of martensite. So typically, the thickness of the plates is about a quarter of a micrometer. And they grow to a limited size of about 10 micrometers. Okay. So it doesn't matter how large your austenite grain is, they will grow to a certain size and stop growing, even if there's no obstacle, <coughs> obstacle to grow. Whereas martensite, you know, is only limited by the grain boundaries of the crystal in which it forms. Okay. So th these are all the peculiar features of bainite that I'm emphasizing, which we have to explain. 
why does it grow to a limited size and stop, and then you have to nucleate a new plate in order for the transformation to continue? Why do we get this particular dispersion of carbides as a function of transformation temperature? So this is what uh, upper bainite looks like in a transmission electron micrograph. You see the scale over here is one micrometer. So these platelets of ferrite are of the order of a quarter of a micrometer in length. Notice that they have very sharp tips. Yeah? Okay. This is another characteristic of a displacive transmission because as I explained in the last lecture, it minimizes the strain energy to have a, a thin plate. And these are the cementite particles that we get between the plates of ferrite. So this is a partially transformed specimen, and you should ignore everything over here. Lower bainite, by contrast, this is a, again a transmission electron micrograph. You see the same scale of plates, but you also have these cementite particles inside the plate and at the boundaries. Okay. When we look at shapes, we really want to look at three-dimensional shapes, yeah, because when we look at 2D sections, the morphology can be misleading. It can, we can misinterpret the morphology. And this is a, a micrograph that was produced uh, by Srinivasan and Raymond in 1968, where this is an edge between two surfaces. Okay? So you can see that this continues on to this, so it truly is a plate shape. But notice the scale over here. This is 50 micrometers. Optically, what appears to be a single plate here actually isn't. You know, it consists of thousands of tiny platelets. And you can see that there is some detailed contrast inside the plates, which we can't resolve using an optical microscope. So this is consistent, again, with a displacive transformation mechanism that the product assumes a shape which is a plate shape in three dimensions. And, of course, we expect this from the strain energy argument that I presented in the last lecture. Okay, if bainite is a displacive transformation, then we also expect to see displacements when we polish a sample of austenite completely flat and allow it to transform <coughs> to bainite. Okay. Now, given the scale of the plates, a quarter of a micrometer. That's just below the resolution of an optical microscope. Yeah, the wavelength of light is about 500 nanometers, whereas the plates are about 200 nanometers wide. So we can't use the normal techniques that are used for Martin's side to detect the displacements. This is an atomic force microscope image of a specimen which was transformed to bainite uh, from a polished surface, and you can see the shear displacements, characteristic of a displacive transformation. You can measure them quantitatively, and you can show that the strains are of the order of 0.26 and delta 0.03. So this is the dilatational strain and the shear strain. So that's, again, completely consistent with a displacive transformation. There is some detail in this micrograph, which is really important. So this is the plate of bainite. And you can see that the austenite adjacent to the plate has been deformed. Okay. Now, when we observe the surface relief due to Martin's sight, we see a displacement which is like this. Okay. So this is the plate of Martin's sight, and this is the austenite. And these two sides are parallel. Okay. So the plate is elastically accommodated. With bainite, what we have is a plastic relaxation in the austenite adjacent to the plate. And this is because we are forming bainite at a relatively high temperature where the austenite is not strong. Yeah, its strength has decreased. And it can't accommodate that huge shear strain elastically. So it relaxes by plastic deformation. And that's the reason for this curvature here. Now, if you look at that region using a transmission electron microscope region of austenite, it is absolutely packed with dislocations from this plastic relaxation. Okay. 
And that is what stops the plate from growing. Because we have to have a glissile interface to get a displacive transformation. If you remember, I drew the structure of the interface as an array of dislocations. So this is the product phase and the parent phase. If you put any obstacles in the way of that array, then it will be halted, just like work hardening. Yeah. So the plate generates the dislocations because the shear strain can't be elastically accommodated, and then those dislocations prevent it from growing further, and you have to nucleate a new plate. Mining site is elastically accommodated, and therefore it continues to grow until it hits uh, a grain boundary. <coughs> Now this is really important because it determines the microstructure. So this is uh, another illustration of the plastic accommodation caused by the shape deformation, whereas this is what you would see with uh, magnetic transformation. So optically, what appears to be a single platelet of bainite, okay, look at the scale here, yeah? actually consists of thousands of tiny platelets. Yeah. So this is one of those optical plates that we saw. Thousands and thousands of tiny platelets, which are halted prematurely by that plastic accommodation, and then you nucleate a new plate in order to propagate transmission. And the length of the platelet at the end of this is the same as the length at the beginning. So they are all growing to a limited size. This is very good for mechanical properties because it's effectively refined the microstructure. Instead of the scale of the plate being that, it's a very minute quarter of a micrometer. So what we see optically as a single plate of bainite actually consists of many, many small platelets of bainite. Okay, so if we have a displacive transformation, yeah, for this one it's useful to dim the lights, then we expect uh, that there is no diffusion of atoms during the transformation. Okay? Now, this is uh, an image taken using a field ion microscope, uh, where each dot is a single atom. Okay? So the magnification is of the order of 10 million times. And this is the boundary between the austenite and the bainite. And each dot represents an atom. Now, with this technique, you can also form an image of particular species of atoms. So here, for example, each dot represents the distribution of iron atoms okay, for the same region and the silicon atoms. And you can measure all this quantitatively, but what you can see from the image is that there is a uniform distribution of the substitutional atoms, iron, silicon, manganese, etc. <coughs> On the finest conceivable scale, there is no movement of those atoms, uh, no diffusion. But I don't know if you can see, the carbon seems to have gone on one side. There are no carbon atoms on this side, whereas there is a lot of carbon on the other side, and this is the austenite. So it appears as if carbon, <coughs> carbon diffuses during the course of transformation. Remember, carbon is an interstitial atom. It sits inside the holes in the crystal, so it can diffuse many orders of magnitude faster, you know, some eight orders of magnitude faster than an iron atom. Okay. So that might not be a surprising observation, but we need to think a little bit about this. Is this carbon actually diffusing during transformation, or has it moved after transformation because it doesn't want to be in the ferrite? You remember you asked that question last time? Okay. So we need to think about, is this truly a diffusionless transformation with nothing diffusing, or does the carbon partition as the plate grows? Okay. It's a very big difference because the free energy change for the second event is much larger than for the first event where nothing diffuses. <coughs> well, supposing we think of a model like this, that the transformation is truly diffusionless. The plate forms exactly like martensite. But we are forming this at a high temperature. So the carbon then escapes into the surrounding austenite. Doesn't want to be inside the ferrite. 
and then it precipitates a cementer to generate our upper vena microstructure. And if we do the transformation at a lower temperature, then there is an opportunity for carbides to precipitate inside the plate and some of the carbon partitions, and we generate the lower vein structure. So what I'd like to know is the time taken to go from here to here. If that is very small compared with our experiments, then we cannot decide whether it's a diffusionless transformation or does the carbon escape from, or does the carbon partition during transformation. So there are two scenarios. One is that it is a diffusionless transformation. Diffusionless with carbon partitioning afterwards. Afterwards. Okay. After growth. And the second is that partitioning occurs during growth. During growth. <coughs> and there is never an excess of carbon in the ferrite simply pushed ahead of the interface as the plate grows, so no access at any instant of growth. Okay, you, we do a calculation for this time. It's a straightforward calculation. And here we are plotting the time in seconds. Okay? As you get towards the margin size start temperature, the time increases substantially. But at the temperatures where bainite is forming, you know, it's a fraction of a second. So there is no way that even in principle you can do an experiment to measure the carbon concentration during growth. And this is why bainite is a really difficult and controversial subject, because to design good experiments to study the mechanism is not easy. Okay? Martin's side is straightforward. Everything is diffusionless. You can measure the composition after it's formed. Here, things can change in a fraction of a second. Okay, so by the time you come to make an observation, carbon will have moved. So let's, there's no way you can do a direct experiment, okay? but let's do a thought experiment using our thermodynamics. So just to remind you again, this is the free energy surface of alpha, the ferrite, free energy surface of gamma, the austenite, and if I draw a common tangent to these curves, I get the equilibrium composition of austenite and of ferrite at a particular temperature, T1, which when I plot on my phase diagram, I get the equilibrium phase boundaries. Okay, so this is ferrite, this is austenite, and here we have a mixture of ferrite and austenite. So if I take uh, uh, an alloy, and it has a composition here, if transformation is happening under equilibrium conditions, then it will stop when the austenite reaches a composition given by this curve here, okay? because that's its equilibrium composition. But this is another point which you don't find on the phase diagram. It defines the composition of austenite and ferrite where they have the same free energy for the same chemical composition. And if I plot the locus of those points as a function of temperature, I get the T0 curve. And the mechanism in which bainite grows without any diffusion cannot occur here because the driving force for diffusionless transformation is positive. So the first mechanism here, diffusionless transformation, is impossible if the austenite composition exceeds this point here. It is possible in this region. So why don't we do an experiment where we take a steel with a composition X bar, we transform it to bainite. So we get a plate of bainite forming without any diffusion at all, but shortly after growth, it partitions carbon. So now the austenite becomes richer in carbon. The next plate of growth, uh, next plate grows from richer austenite, and this process can continue until we hit the T0 curve. After that, diffusionless transformation is impossible. On the other hand, if the second mechanism applies, that means carbon partitions during growth, that there is no reason why it cannot continue until it hits this equilibrium phase boundary. Okay. And there you go. Confirms that growth is 
diffusionless, but shortly after transformation, the carbon partitions from the ferrite into the ostomy. So the reaction is incomplete in the sense that this is what equilibrium demands, but this is where it stops. So this is known as the incomplete reaction phenomenon, that the transformation stops before the austenite has reached its equilibrium composition because the mechanism of growth is diffusionless. Now, of course, there are many predictions which come out of this model, that vainite actually grows without any diffusion, but shortly after growth, the carbon is partitioned. And one of them is that the growth rate will be very high. You know, it will be far greater than allowed by the diffusion of carbon. So, this is a, a sequence of pictures taken using an instrument known as a photoemission electron microscope. Okay, so basically what this is, is a hot stage microscope where we can observe the transformation as it happens at a high temperature. You shine an ultraviolet light onto your sample and that causes the emission of electrons. And those electrons are being used to form the image. Okay? Because you need the high resolution to spot plates of vainite. You can't do this in a hot stage optical microscope. Okay? So just think of it as observing plates of vainite forming uh, in real time. So the transformation will start from somewhere here and you'll see some plates growing. So we can measure the growth rate of the plates of vena, platelets of vena, and it turns out to be three orders of magnitude faster than would be permitted by the diffusion of carbon during growth. Okay. So that's again consistent with the theory. Now, of course, it isn't a thousand meters per second as it is for modern sound. That it's much slower than the speed of sound in the metal, and that's because there's plastic relaxation going on all the time, which damps the growth of the plates. Okay, so we've covered, basically, the mechanism of vainite. <coughs> the transformation is displacing. You can observe the displacements clearly when you polish a specimen and allow it to form vainite. Uh, the transformation temperature is greater than martensite, it grows without diffusion, but shortly after growth, the carbon escapes into the remaining austenite. This is really important. The shape deformation is plastically accommodated, and that has a big consequence on the development of microstructure. Uh, we call the tiny platelets, we call subunits, and the cluster, they form clusters of platelets, which on an optical scale appear as if they are themselves platelets of bainite. Now, the theory, of course, naturally explains, quantitatively explains, the development of upper and lower bainite, because here the time taken to partition carbon is very small, so precipitation only happens from the remaining austenite. Whereas here, the time taken to partition carbon is larger, so there is an opportunity to precipitate carbon inside the ferrite, and you end up with a classical lower bainite microstructure. Okay, so I'm going to go on to Wiebenstein ferrite, but does anybody have questions on Bainite? Now, uh, Harry, uh, you have a situation, say for example, in modern steel, you don't get a clear distinction of uh, upper and lower Bainite. Right. You get sometimes it's called uh, ferrite with aligned carbide in a ferrite with non-aligned carbide. Yes. Uh, so how that sort of thing happens? Is it a similar principle? That's a very, very good question. Um, See, modern steels contain very little carbon, uh, you know, less than 0.1 weight percent, sometimes even 0 0.03 weight percent. Yeah? Now, the quantitative theory for the transition from upper to lower bainite predicts that when you get to less than about 0.4 weight percent carbon uh, in a plain carbon steel, you do not ever get lower bainite. So you start from perlite upper bainite and you go straight to martensite because the carbon can partition so rapidly with a low carbon concentration 
that there's never an opportunity to precipitate semen dump. Okay? On the other hand, if you have a carbon concentration more than 0.6 weight percent, you never get upper vein dump. There's always enough time available to precipitate. So that was a theoretical prediction and experimentally verified. You know, we made the steels and Sure enough, you go directly from perlite to low vainite to modern site when the carbon concentration is such that there is an opportunity to precipitate carbides. So in modern steels, you will never get low vainite, you know, if they have a sufficiently low carbon concentration. So you observe transmission electron microgas, you won't find the carbides inside the plates. How do you form in the non-aligned sort of in the carbides within the ferrite? Uh, it's called, uh, you know, in, in, in IIW term, FS in bracket NA, you know, ferrite with uh, non-aligned second phase. Right. And, and sometimes, you know, they, people call it, you know, <laughs> uh, Benedi structure. Okay, well, you know, I know a German professor who tells his students that anything you don't understand, call it Baymite. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but here we are focusing on things that you can calculate. Yeah? Yeah? You said the length of the Baymite pipe was about 10 microns. Mm -hmm. That's the same for both upper and lower? Or yeah. So? yeah. Because it's determined by the plastic, plastic. accommodation problem. Okay, so let me uh, carry on. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, um, the, every aspect will be changed by alloying elements because the free energy changes, the free, uh, you know, delta G gamma to alpha changes. Um, even the free energy of the precipitation process changes. And you may get a different carbon rather than the same Yes. Uh, again, I didn't go into this, but as you go to high carbon concentrations, uh, you tend to precipitate epsilon carbon mm -hmm. instead of cement in here. So it's just like martensite. You know, when you temper martensite, depending on the composition, you get cement you get epsilon carbide or hog, and many different transition carbide. Can I ask a totally different thing? Mm -hmm. In titanium, we also get the martensite transformation. Right. And then in titanium, we also get like large structures. Is mm -hmm. there a sort of equivalent structure to bainite in right. or not? So that's, again, that is a really important question. The martensite side, I have no problem with. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same mechanisms and so on. But titanium is a substitutional alloy only. Yeah. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. all the atoms are substitutional. All the important atoms yes. are substitutional. Okay. Uh, now, I don't see the analogy because once you have substitutional elements partitioning, that means you have sufficient diffusion mm -hmm. to just have a reconstructive transformation. You know? That's where you get alpha rats with beta in between. That's right. But, but that is ion diffusing there. That's right. I mean, the compositions are different from the substitutional alloying element mm -hmm. point of view. Okay, so just to follow on from Lata's question, yeah, this is a, a summary of the two different mechanisms of importance. That look, supposing we have this crystal here, and it's got square atoms and round atoms, and we've defined a unit cell here. Okay. To get a displacement transformation, I'm simply going to deform this <coughs> into a different crystal structure here. So this is the new unit cell. Okay. And naturally, if I generate the new pattern by a deformation, then the shape of the crystal will change. Yeah. And that's where the displacement, you know, the displacements that we observe using atomic force microscopy or interference microscopy, that's where they come from. So this is a physical deformation. And furthermore, there is an atomic correspondence between this and this. So we know that this atom came exactly from this location in the parent. And similarly, that this came from exactly that point. Okay? So that's called an atomic correspondence. Their neighbors are not altered. And this is the basis of the shape memory effect. You see, if I reverse the transformation, then I recover exactly 
the original atomic arrangement. Okay? So that uh, displacive transformation is dominated by strain. On the other hand, in a reconstructive transformation, I break all the bonds and rearrange the atoms into the different pattern without changing the external shape. Okay. Now, how can I do that? Well, think of it as follows. First, I do a displacive transformation. Then I cut off this triangle here, and I transport it onto this side. That's the mass transport that's necessary to achieve the change in crystal structure without a change in shape. So this cannot happen without diffusion. Okay. Now, given that it cannot happen without diffusion, the square atoms really don't want to be here, and therefore they have redistributed into the product phase. So we will get partitioning of elements into phases where the atoms are happy. So that's the essential difference between a reconstructive and a displacive transformation. And so far we've talked about, you know, martensitic transformations, bainite, where nothing diffuses. Okay? Whereas uh, with perlite and ferrite, which forms at high temperature, these are reconstructive transformations. I haven't covered them yet, but I will do so tomorrow. <coughs> And another analogy for a displacive and a reconstructive transformation is that imagine we have a queue of soldiers here uh, waiting to board military transport. And the transport arrives and they are ordered to board the bus and they do so in a highly disciplined manner. Okay? So the sequence of soldiers is the same in the bus as in the queue. There is an atomic correspondence. We know that the neighbor of one is two. And that is the case, whether they like each other or not. Okay? They are forced to sit in that arrangement, so there's a lot of strain energy. So this is a, an analogy that Christian gave for martensitic transformations. Now let's compare that with a reconstructive transformations. We have a queue of civilians. When the bus comes, they just rush on it in an uncoordinated manner and sit next to their friends, so there's no strain energy there. Okay? So reconstructive and displacive transformation. And there is a third variant to this, okay? Uh, and that is when we have substitutional solids and interstitial solids. So here we have what's called a paramilitary transformation. It's between a civilian and a military situation where we have all these uh, soldiers in a queue, but we also have ill-disciplined small atoms. So when they board the bus, we have an atomic correspondence with respect to the large atoms. Okay? They're not allowed to diffuse, but the small ones find the lowest energy configuration. So this is a paramilitary transformation, and that's what happens when I raise the transformation temperature now from bainite. So that we go to Wiedmann-Staden ferrite. So this is the last of the displacive transformations. It is a paramilitary transformation in which the substitutional lattice is displaced, but the carbon atoms definitely partition during growth because it can happen even about the T0 temperature. The microstructure looks like this, that we have our austenite grains and we get these large, quite coarse plates starting from the austenite grain boundaries or from some ferrite that was present from a higher transformation temperature. So the jargon is that you call these primary plates and secondary plates because they're growing from existing ferrite. Um, one thing I want you to notice, I've drawn this very carefully, is that these plates are no longer like the plates of martensite and bainite, formed like thin lenses, but they form as wedges. Okay. So if I show you a micrograph, they taper in this way. They're not like a lens with both tapering in both directions. Okay. So this is an optical micrograph, and unlike the uh, bainite, which I'll, I'll just show you to remind you, show you the optical micrograph of the bainite, this is etching dark using night owl. Yeah. You can see these are dark plates. It's the same scale as the other micrograph. And that's because there's an awful lot of interfaces inside this macroscopic plate, there are many other platelets, and when you have lots and lots of boundaries, they will be attacked by the action, and therefore this appears dark. Okay. Now contrast that 
with Greenman's down the far right. Same sort of scale, and it's etching white, <laughs> which means that there is very little structure inside that plate. It appears like it's a single platelet. Of course, you, uh, because these are coarse, we can measure the surface relief uh, using uh, optical microscopy. The first slide on this side shows uh, displacement of scratches which were present on the surface, and the second is a Dolansky interference optical micrograph. Now, this is really classic work which was done in Australia by Watson and McDougall. So these pictures were published in 1973 where these guys did very careful measurements of the displacements due to Greenman's standard ferrite. Okay. So a lot of the crystallography on displacive transformations originates in Australia. So we have a shape deformation consistent with the fact that the substitutional lattice is being sheared into the, into the product phase. Now, the shear, if I go back to the experimental deformation, you see, here's a scratch which is being displaced this way and then it's being displaced this way. So it's not exactly like the shears that we see with martensite and with bainite. It's more like a tent-shaped surface relief. Yeah. Here is what you would expect from a single platelet. What it indicates is that what we see optically as a single plate is actually two self-accommodating plates. They are cancelling out each other's shear deformation. Now, why should that happen? Well, we are forming Wiedemann's sudden ferrite at a high temperature where the driving force for transformation is small. So you cannot sustain the huge strain energy, 600 joules per mole, associated with a single platelet. So what's happening is really clever. You're getting two plates growing simultaneously in such a way that they cancel out each other's displacement, roughly cancel out. Okay. Strain energy is reduced to something like 50 joules per mole. Now, because these are two different plates, there are different variants of the habit plane. Yeah, so here we have 558 five, gamma, and here 585 five, gamma. So obviously if they have different displacement directions, then they will also have different habit planes. And that is the reason why we see a thin plate, uh, uh, sorry, a, a wedge-shaped morphology. And of course you predict that if you look at this in a transmission electron microscope, you should be able to see a boundary between these two plates. And that's exactly what, what you see. So this is what optically appears to be a single platelet, really consists of two platelets which accommodate each other's displacement to minimize the strain energy. Okay? Because at these high temperatures where Riemann's and ferrite forms, there isn't enough driving force to accommodate a single platelet. Could there be more than two though? Sorry? Is it always two plates? Uh, you, can, you can certainly uh, form clusters of plates which accommodate, but in general, you know, it's difficult to nucleate two plates simultaneously, mm -hmm. which will do the right job. So if you involve more platelets, it's even more difficult. So the vast majority of them will be pairs of platelets. Yeah, but they're not like twins or anything. They're, they're not. Again, that's a, that's a very good question. So you can get different degrees of accommodation depending on the relative orientation and the largest accommodation is when the misorientation is small mm -hmm. between the adjacent plates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are 24 possible variants and calculations have been done to see which variants would give you the best accommodation. So you see, it's, it's very clever. It's cancelling out the shape deformation but there's a cost associated with that and that is that you have to nucleate those two platelets simultaneously. Yeah. So the probability of nucleation decreases, and we always have a coarser microstructure associated with Wiedemann's sudden ferrite. You know, bainite, martensite are extremely fine, but if you cut down the nucleation rate, then the microstructure coarsens. Yeah. That's a surprising number. Very low probability of actually getting those two to, 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 to nuclear. Exactly, exactly right. 
Because that was wrong. Yeah, that's the, that's the trick that I could yeah. Otherwise, you know, all transformations could cancel yeah, out. Yeah, I yeah. thought that's a pretty yeah. good trick to do. I mean, that's, that's right. But well, there's a price to pay. Right? There's a price to pay for that. that. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, then, of course, you also predict that although this is a displacive transformation, carbon has to diffuse. It's a thermodynamic necessity. It's forming about T0. Yeah? Therefore, the plates will lengthen at a rate which is controlled by the diffusion of carbon. Yeah. And indeed, that is exactly what you see, is that the measured lengthening rate and the calculated lengthening rate from diffusion control are, are roughly the same. Okay. Uh, so, to summarize, uh, for Wiedemann ferrite, the mechanism of transformation is displacing. It is absolutely necessary for carbon to partition during growth. You cannot sustain diffusion less transformation. And that pairs of plates grow together to cancel out the strain energy and allow the transformation to happen at a low undercooling below the equilibrium temperature. Now, in the next lecture, we are going to use all this to design some spectacular steels. Okay? So I will show you how all this theory can be used to design very nice steels. But I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. I'll come back to titanium. Yeah. They also form with That's right. So is it the same sort of yeah. mechanism? Well, I mean, the plates do grow controlled by the partitioning mm -hmm. of elements. But again, I'm not clear about this displacement. Mm -hmm. you know, because if substitutional atoms are, are moving, then why, why not just minimize the strain energy? So it's, it's an important question which is unanswered, I think. Is there any uh, elemental or alloying effect on, on Whitman's pattern growth? So yeah. if there is an effect, you know, how it uh, enhances or you know, Yeah, enhance. how does that effect work? Yeah. So I'll show you two slides, okay? Uh, first is what I started with. And this is a logarithmic scale here. Yeah? And you can see that the effect of adding manganese to this alloy, I have a small effect on the displacive transformation, but a very large effect on the reconstructive transformation, because remember, this is a log scale. Okay. So every element will change the thermodynamics. Okay. So you know, the driving force for transformation will be altered, and manganese reduces that driving force. So we expect reactions to be retarded, whether they are displacive or reconstructive because the thermodynamic effect applies everywhere. But here we also require manganese to partition during growth. So diffusion is, is slowing down. So here you have a much bigger effect of alloying elements than in displacive transformation, because here you have the thermodynamic effect and diffusion. And just to, um, let me just uh, find one more slide. Just to show you how big an effect there can be, okay. particularly of, uh, of carbon. So, uh, this is a plot of the growth rate of Wittgenstein mm -hmm. ferrite versus the carbon concentration. And at a very low carbon concentration, you can see the growth rate is hundreds of micrometers per second. And it's very sensitive to carbon because the carbon is diffusing, the only element that's diffusing. Uh, you know, you can reduce it to tens of micrometers per second. And very often, you know, we are working in modern seals, we are working in this regime. No more questions. Can we thank Harry for the presentation? Thank you.